Hey, welcome back to Wild Speculations. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. This week we talk about Critical Role Campaign 2, Episode 80, The Folding Halls. Yes. Uh, a return to the Happy Fun Time Ball. Yes. <clears throat> um, One of four names now yes. that we have for it. Yes, the Archmage Bane. Archmage Bane, Heirloom Sphere, The Folding Halls of Halas, and The Happy Fun Time Ball. Yep. Uh, Some seem more innocent than others. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and all are arguably deceptive as to its true purpose. Yes. Um, but we'll get into that. Um, this episode to me seemed very produced. Um, Matt and the players seemed more focused than normal in the direction that the episode was going to go. Um, so you're thinking Matt didn't have time so Brian wrote this episode? No. <laughs> I think uh, over the last uh, two weeks uh, they had a lot of production meetings. Um, and I think, uh, a combination of their expressing, expressing desires in the episode, mm -hmm. uh, in episode 79, where Liam was like, we were just, we're just chosen for a fight, right. you know, uh, I think Matt heard that and they had a lot of fun in the last dungeon crawl. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in a lot of ways it came down to, hey, we we want to do something different from what we have been doing. We don't want to have to think too much uh, because Matt had that map at the table ready to give them. Uh, and that's not something that's not something that the DM can just prepare and have lying about um, he knew they were going into the happy fun time ball because they confirmed with him we're going to go to Nicodranas I think everything that we saw in the, in the first act basically of the episode of them recounting the mm -hmm. ass beating they got or not necessarily ass beaten, just they didn't sheer and utter defeat. Yeah, um, the recounting of that was, uh, I think that happened out of character in meetings. Mm. Um, this is not to say every group will have out of character discussions. Sometimes yeah. one, two at a time. They have a text thread yeah. that they use. Um, one which has Matt in it. The other is just the players. Yeah. Um, and they've talked about them using that to discuss what's going on. But I think with everything that went on over the last two weeks uh, outside of game, they wanted something dungeon crawly. Uh, to go forward, so I—that's uh, my feeling. I could be totally wrong. I think you are. Um, but I mean, you make good points. Um, I think he was more prepared. I, th I think he knew they were going back to Nicodranas, and he wanted to set this up. Um, and so I, I, I feel—I feel it was more railroady. I don't feel it was more produced than an average episode. You know what I'm saying? Railroading more than produced in that. Yes, I'll, 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 I can see where you're coming from in that. Yeah, um, but the thing is, judging by the indication of Matt and the foreshadowing that he has done, his railroad would have been to do Essex's job, mm. and Essex basically, in the so, in the dialogue, said, "Sounds like what you guys are dealing with is more important than what I need you for. So maybe you should do that." 
I, I think, again, I think what happened is they expressed wanting to go to Nick Adronis, whether that be in the text thread. I know they briefly mentioned it. Yeah, in the episode. Um, and in the episode, they definitely mentioned it. Yeah. Um, I think he's like, okay, they're going back. Because they really weren't. I mean, yes, they could have left, but it was really less of an open option. What are you going to do, Mighty Night? It's, hey, come with me. I've got this issue. I need your help with it. Yeah. And to make sure they went along with it, he brought back someone who he knew they trusted as players. Yeah. Uh, well. And there's considerable, you know, and it, with the perma heart, which we can get into later, it's giving them an out because they're, the players are running into a brick wall with how to handle the anti nine. Yeah. Um, and, hey, here's something. Well, and Laura called it. And, yeah, Laura called it. And honestly, I'm surprised that Caleb didn't think to contact Yusa uh, about this anyway. Issue. Being probably the most powerful wizard that he's comfortable with. Well, this comes back to Caduceus's observation that they they need an ecosystem yeah and they don't have one yep um and i love like in that whole talk you know and i a little bit of kindling for the anti-nine i had paired caleb and oban as the spellcasters and caleb said, says I, I can't keep up with oban yeah <laughs> yeah um Yeah, I don't know. But we also, we got to see some of Ford's new Yes, we abilities. got to see two of them in this episode. Yep, uh, the sea invisibility for one yep. hour. Um, which will be handy. And, like, they were like, they, I think they were honing in on the right tactic to use. But they hadn't arrived there yet. Mm -hmm. Which is contain all of our really sensitive, dangerous talking to the hour that Ford can see invisible things. Yes. Because uh, they're like, you know, do that more often. And Lord Jester's like, we'll just dispel randomly. That's not going to work. And or the other option is to do so in the hut. Yeah. Yeah. If you have to have another discussion and Ford has used his ability... Wait 10 minutes, throw up a hut. Yep. Um, and then the other, and I'm not sure what exactly it was, if it was just a retribution thing, or if it's basically a radiant-flavored armor of Agathis. Uh, but when he got attacked, the sword turned blue, and it took radiant damage. I think... I think it was a D8 he was rolling. But I could be wrong. It could also have been a D four. Yeah. Um, but I think I. I well, no, it couldn't have been a D four because he said five points. Unless there's a modifier. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, because Travis said one point, Matt Rowland said actually five. Corrected him that it was, or he corrected him that it was five points. So that would be plus his con modifier, possibly. So a D, maybe a D four plus, plus his con, con mod. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder how long that lasts and if it's repeatable. Yeah. Or if that's a once per day thing. Yeah, or once per day, or maybe a reaction. Uh, no. No, because he didn't use his reaction for it. Yeah, it just he used a bonus action to activate it, mm. and then in subsequent turns it just did the damage. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, but we also got definite proof that 
someone is spying on the Shore House. Yes, which we've said from the beginning. Yep. The perfect way. I mean, you don't have to target a person, just a place. Yep. Um, uh, Essek has either proven himself or incriminated himself with the Bright Queen, though. Yeah, I feel, I feel bad for Essek because I can just imagine what's going on in his life. Yeah. Uh, because, like, the Mighty Nine come, they give them the beacons, they give them information that basically yeah. causes a crushing defeat for the Empire, uh, a stunning victory for the dynasty, and they want some more of that, which means the Empire is giving them what for. Yeah. Uh, and and or the uh, the scourgers scared him. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Um, but I think the Bright Queen is leaning on Essek, especially if mm -hmm. he told her that the Mighty Nine were going into the Empire to yeah. find a beacon where the other beacon is, and then they come back. And don't give that information. Yeah, don't have it. Um, because it's like, they've already delivered once, and now they're promising to do it again, essentially. Yeah. Uh, we need that now. Um, but I think this is the strongest case that they have made, that it's a third party. Yeah. And especially they've done it in a way that will catch the attention of Bright Queen. Because they said, look, the guy he just woke up worked for Loth. Mm -hmm. um, and had a contract from. I think yeah. that's secondary. It's the fact that this guy was a minion of Loth. Yeah. Yeah, and since they broke away from Loth. Right. Uh, we had more demonstration of Travis's memory hole. Yes, Ukatoa's so revenge deepens. <laughs> she lose your memory with your class? <laughs> Uh, an un unfair and inaccurate statement because he didn't technically lose his class. He just changed the patient behind the next blade. True. Uh, and Travis has always had a bad memory. Yeah. So, uh, but Sam proved, and I wonder what he is trying to extract from Laura because Laura said. I bet I can find it first when they were looking through their notes yeah. about who the name of the goblin, Den Mother. Mm -hmm. And Sam found it first. Yep. Um, which made me think, I was like, you know, Marisha is the copious note taker. Mm -hmm. She writes whole paragraphs yeah. in her notebooks. And Laura writes a little bit and draws a lot. And Sam seems to take random notes in random ways because Travis is like your uh, Kevin, they say Kevin Spacey notes from Seven or something like yeah. that. Uh, and so I imagine Sam is writing, you know, all different kind of angles and yeah. in random places. Um, like I take notes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But he, all, he does seem to be able to find stuff much faster than either of Marisha or Laura. Yeah. Um, well, in Marisha's defense, she's got a lot more to go through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of other things there. Uh, Caduceus cast Commune, and Ford is included in the effects of Commune. Which I thought was an interesting narrative choice. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, but... Now, is it strictly because they're both tied to the Wild Mother? Like, if a guest star played someone tied to the Wild Mother, would they both get the effects if that person cast Commune? Or is he setting it up for Ford to be... Caduceus is Robin. Huh. 
Not I'm necessarily well, Batman that. Robin is the right, but you know, yeah. sidekick. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. Um, I think. I think depending on what Matt has behind it, because you're right, what what does that say? Um, I think I would have had the wind coming from Ford. Mm. From the direction of where wherever Ford is standing, that's the direction that the wind is coming from. And Ford doesn't notice it for two reasons. One, Ford doesn't have a very good wisdom. Yeah. Uh, so he might not notice it but also because he is a charisma based caster a warlock that is sort of the wild mother's direct Im imprint on the mm -hmm. world and so that's why I, if if matt wanted to if you wanted to tie them together the whatever the cleric is doing is being channeled through the warlock okay yeah um, rather than the two of them. But, I mean, at, at that point, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's a matter of Matt has connected divine casting effects between two players and two different classes. Um, yeah, really the only thing linking them is the deities. Yeah, well, and the fact that the whole reason Ford is yeah. in service of the Wild Mother is Caduceus. Right, which is why I bring up the sidekick thing, or the apprentice. So. His, well, his sword. Alt Alter boy to the father, whatever, you know. Um, yeah, a Ford is the sword of the wild mother. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, is what he is now. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it's also not the first time that Matt's done stuff like this either. True. Because even before Ford took the the pact, he was tangentially connected. Yeah. Um, but in all of those times, Ford was sitting down with him while he was doing it. You know, hey, let's do this. Well, arguably they were all sitting together under the tree. Right, but it wasn't like... I mean, that's like when Jester scribes, you know, or and they're all just there, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas before it was a purposeful, you're with me while I'm doing this. Now it's just, you happen to be in the same room. Yeah. Um, do you think, like we've discussed how the connection between Jester and the Traveler is different from Caduceus and the Wild Mother, and now mm -hmm. Ford and the Wild Mother. Yeah. Um, and Caduceus essentially has always had to cast a spell to get his interactions with the Wild Mother. Right. Where Jester, he just appears. Mm -hmm. um, not always when she wants him to. And she has often felt his absence. Um, but in this episode, is the first time where really uh, Jester starts poo pooing the idea yeah. of the Wild Mother being a force in Caduceus's life. Uh, that, you know, I could just talk to them, talk to the Traveler. He would just tell me. Yeah. Um, do you think? And Matt has never done that in those scenes. Mm -hmm. He has never delivered knowledge that Jester is seeking, right? Or anything. He's never done anything that a spell is required to do. It's always been role play, or I am tasking you. Yeah, with Traveler Con or, or what have you. Um, um, do you think Laura doesn't take those spells 
because she doesn't want to rely on them or that she doesn't think that she needs them? Well, she doesn't think she needs them. Um, and part of the reason why this kind of thing happens, like the role play version, is because he's not on the other side of the divine game. That's true, too. Wild Mother is. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. Um, do you think the Traveler wants to bring down the Divine Gate? No. Nope. Or just get on the other side of it? Or maybe not even get on the other side of it, just become yeah. a new god on Exodus. Yeah. It's fair. Well, He's trying to do what Vecna did. Why, why, well, different motivations, but yes, essentially. Be the only god on this side of the divine why, gate. Why bring down the divine gate and have the competition for followers? Why go yeah. to the other side and have the competition for followers? Yeah, and not the ability to perform the miracles, yeah. Well, why not just hang out and corner the market, so to speak? True, fair. Um, oh, we also got confirmation on talks uh, that Caleb's arm touch to yes. Essek did not had nothing to do with the yes. insight check. Yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on that because we spent some time. Yeah, yeah, because you had a. Yeah, and I still well, like your theory, but yeah, and I wasn't the only one. Yeah, so. Well, nothing we say we're the only ones. With as many critters as out there. True. Uh, I did like Caduceus's. That was the last time that we were humble and honest. Yeah. Uh, and that but got like, the... Oh, yeah. That is the last time we did anything like that. Uh, and that got the biggest laugh out of Matt of the episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tried something we haven't tried since. Being humble and honest. Maybe that's why people didn't hate us. Maybe that's why they hate us immediately. Maybe. Yeah. In game and in life, kids. Right. Um, we're told that Dyron found evidence that proved her theory. Mm -hmm. And that she needs to get out of here because... She's too close to being found out. Right. Um, and then they go. And they teleport again without notice. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I like the reaction when... Like, oh yeah, can you uh, maybe tell him I'm an expositor and maybe lift the bands? Or as she says <laughs> when she leaves, can you clear the parking tickets? <laughs> yeah. And then they do have their training session, gearing up for the next level. And I love that Cad watched the whole thing from the hot tub. <laughs> She's like, yeah, this is nice. And for once, it wasn't retroactive that he was trying to put himself there. Right. Because he had said, I'm going to be in the hot tub. And that's where they went to have their discussion. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, that was good. Um, but I stood up when Matt asked, Laura to roll percentile dice mm. on the sending. Because I knew immediately. I was like, oh, buddy. Here it comes. Uh, and it, he said it got through, but no response. Um, which, which I was a little confused on. Because he had been in the fun ball for three weeks at this point. Yeah. Sending only operates on the same plane. No. Oh, There's a this? percentage chance. Oh. It crosses. Okay, I did not and realize that's, that. And that's why I knew that he was in a happy fun time. Okay. That's, that, Matt calling for that, I was like, oh, that's where he's, he's there. Okay. Um, I, I didn't connect that because I didn't realize there was a chance it could uh, yeah. go through. I thought it was just strictly this plane only. Yeah, I think it's a thirty-three percent chance or something like that. Like oh, she, she had just, yeah, so she just, just made, made it. it. Yeah, um, I could be wrong, but I think it's like it's it's not fifty-fifty. Right. I don't think. Um, 
and it's better than I think it's better than twenty five. So, but yeah, she, yeah, um, which means he's probably unconscious. And if you run the hours to days, he's been in there almost a day himself in his time. If it's consistent. If it's consistent, which Matt continually points out, you don't know if it's consistent throughout the whole thing. Right. I also think one of the components of that temporal change is how many time, how many passages you go through. Because I started thinking about this, that there probably is a set temporal offset, but Matt, either as they traverse or when they come back, will roll the dice. And I think it's probably it's probably like a D four days. See, and my thought is that it depends on what room they're in. Because... Oh, 5% chance. Thank you. Tofinator. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, because... And here... My running theory right now is that it is a... Um, it is an extra dimensional space, but it's connected to other planes. Yes. And that's based on the Permahawk being in the Astral Sea, but also in the Happy Fun Ball. So depending on the time shift between the planes and the Prime Material plane, and where you're at in the Happy Fun Ball. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, the Allura arriving yeah. was a great moment for them at the table. Um, Who surpassed his background check? <laughs> uh, I loved the the whole lead up to that, and because Matt did his best to ensure that the goblin didn't ask who yeah this was to to hold off until she arrived yeah yeah um. Um, but not the first NPC from Campaign 1. No. Uh, just the first one that they were excited yes. to meet. Well, the first major NPC. Yeah, okay, fair. Yeah. The first... Re uh, um, well, Because, I mean, Matt even said that Allura was his self-insert into Campaign 1. Yeah. You know, which argues that... Which begs the question... Is Yuzo or Essek his insert yeah. into Campaign 2? Um, well, Yuzo is now established as part of the Arcana Dependent. Possible. She is said he? She said he was a member. And that's how they know each other is through the... Hmm. I missed that. Uh, I always got the feeling that he was just he did his that he did his best to be like Morden Kane and be apart and neutral from everybody. Um, but maybe a long time ago he, he's an elf, so yeah. Well, I mean, Morden Kane did that, but even he was part of the council, you know. That's true. Uh, but also one of the things that we know from. Uh, I almost said Caleb. I almost did the same thing Liam did. From Frumpkin going in through the door and then coming back. Yes. That Yeza cleared out the study. Which yeah. means Allura has yeah. access to all, all those books. Yeah. Probably the whole hence logical. I don't think I'm saying that right, but I'm not sure. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. So we'll we'll see how much because I think she spent her time those three days yeah. looking through his notes. Yes. Um and I think as time goes on, she will look into the books that he has. Mm -hmm. Especially once the goblin says, Well, he brought these out of there. Yeah. Um though 
how much those books will be of help, I don't know. Um, yeah. But Matt wrote a lot to bring the happy fun time ball into the main arc of the campaign. Because we discussed when uh, uh, Deborah was on mm -hmm. that this was just a fun way to drop a little dungeon crawl yeah. for the guest star that doesn't necessarily impact the campaign. Uh, he sprinkled in a few lore drops within mm -hmm. that. Um, but I think he went back and... You think he rewrote it to be a part? Because I think I remember him saying that it was something he intended them to find later on in the campaign. He didn't intend to have them have access to it that early. Uh, and that's... No, when, when questioned, he thought that Deborah was going to take it with her. Right, because he didn't want them to have access to it that early. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It. There was a lot in this episode that I was like, wow, because some of the mechanics of how the... The, the space worked, how the ball worked, mm -hmm. were a little more refined this time. Yeah. Uh, and the connections, like the fact that Matt had a map now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this time it was just, he had put more thought into what he's had, what, three months at yeah. least to do it? Um, well, Especially when, once he hinted that you needed the, the Laughing Hand's heart that it was in another plane, somewhere on the border of the Astral Sea, or near the border of the Astral Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, and we speculated perhaps the far, far realm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think once he laid that, that's when he had decided that the... Happy fun ball. Okay, yeah. I can buy that. Um, um, real and quick. he was already setting up Halas as a connection to the Calamity. Yeah. And I think Halas is also Caleb's wizard that went back in time. Okay, I can see that. A um, couple of things for Halas and stuff, and uh, since we're there. Uh, so Beauregard gets a natural 20 on an investigation and connects the heart with the perma heart. And, you know, just recalled it, yada, yada, yada. So, is this is this indicative of Halas having worked with Torog or been a follower of Torog and hid the heart in the Happy Fun Ball, or did Halas find the heart and tether his Happy Fun Ball to it if it is a network through the planes later? So, yes. Um. I don't know if he was working with Tornog directly, but the Arcanists were definitely allied with the Betrayer Gods. Right. Um, and I think we're seeing more of that backstory play out. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, he does, there is a room connected to the Permaheart called the Heart Study on the map. But that could easily just have been or maybe he discovered this ploy and captured it himself for his own uses. Yeah. Which also only served to... Right. Now here's the other question. So if he was working with Turan directly, indirectly, whatever, died the heart, and this ball's been passed down, passed down, you know, does that mean Sir uh, Cadden? What was his name? Cad Cadigan? Sir Cadigan? Uh, that had imprisoned Twiggy? That was supposed to receive the ball? The ball was going to him when she stole it? Is he part of the Angel of Iron's cult? Mm, yeah, maybe. Better question. The Sending Stone Caleb has that they found in the corrupt arcanist's home yeah. in Zadash, is he connected? Are they connected with 
them? Yeah. Or are they involved in the cross Empire Dynasty conspiracy? Yeah. Um, so I'm I don't know if they will make that connection. I don't know if Matt will make that connection for them. Uh, um, so yeah, I, I'm wondering how, how many of these seeds that were planted will bear fruit. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. But in the meantime, uh, we have basically a series of holodeck episodes. Uh, as I've come to think of these uh, happy fun time episodes. Yeah, I mean, the holodeck episodes where the security goes offline and things get real. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when the safeties break and they're at risk of death. Yes. Um, so, uh, speaking of the planar constructs, uh, the glass, the mm -hmm. stained glass window in the study, I think is a huge clue. Um, and I kind of wish they had gone back there. Yeah. Because I think that window is a shortcut to everything. Yeah, I agree. And Ford happened to find the one that, that was directed the exit. and exit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of wish that they had gone there, but it's the labyrinth sort of trope. Yeah. If they had gone that way, they would have gone straight to the castle. <laughs> Don't go that way! Never go that way! Uh, so, Fucking yeah. Love that movie. Uh, but they're talking about uh, the crystal cave, or crystal mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a connection to the elemental plane of Earth. Okay. Um, and I think we've arguably seen evidence of a connection to the plane of fire um, mm -hmm. because they took uh, if memory serves uh, one of the tapestries yeah blew out fire yeah um, yep one definitely did yeah so We'll see if they find another way. But I think... I have a feeling hidden within these rooms are exits to these extraplanar areas. Um, where this is a pocket dimension, but there is a okay. tether to each of these places. And she said, Allura said that apparently he used this to collect regents and... For study, mm -hmm. so he was having all these things. So this was his. It, it's not a, a death ball. It's designed to keep people out, to keep it secure. But for him, it's his laboratory. Yeah. Um. And well, the I, defenses are specifically against mages. Yes. So his primary rivals. Yes. Exactly. Um. So. The dreadnought that they all failed their his, their arcana check on, and it's telling that it was an arcana check Matt asked for. Not history, not religion, arcana. Yeah, if it had been history, it would have been the GI Joe reference. Yeah. Uh, I brought up the possibility that Alexandria is made from the body of a dead astral dreadnought. Yep. This is the first bit of real evidence that that might be the case. Yep. So I was excited by that. Uh, now, I don't know if that room will have a, a live dreadnought or maybe a baby dreadnought or if it's like nowhere and it's just the head. Yeah. Um,. I don't know. And I kind of wish they had gone that way, but they were avoiding it. So we're going to get uh, 
which way did they go again? Shit. Uh, the garden, and then they were going to the tower, and then the golems, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm expecting in the gol. So, what do you make of the tower? Because I have some ideas on what they might find inside. Yeah, okay, what are they? Uh, monodromes. Okay. Um, I think the tower, the, the just the mechanics of it, seems very... Uh, I think the, it's the plane of order, or mm -hmm. law. Yeah. Uh, so uh, That would be very interesting. I haven't seen monodromes come up in a game in a long time. Yeah. Um, I could be wrong, but I that's... Mean, I'm talking AD&D &D since I've seen a lot of drugs come up in a game. <laughs> uh, they, 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 played a, they played a prominent role in, played, uh, in Dice Camera Action. Which uh, I don't watch, so... Yeah. Um, it was always a monodrome that heralded the arrival of bad things. Gotcha. Uh, but that's because... Uh, Strix is from Sigil, mm. originally, so, uh, and monodrones are all over there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, which makes me worried that we might see that CR, is it 21, uh, Agent of Order? Oh, yeah. In Mordenkainen's? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think we will, but that got me worried. Uh, or, on the other hand, that might be a good place, a good way for Matt to give exposition. Mm -hmm. Because that being, if it is there, will have a purpose to be there. And, or maybe it made a deal to basically keep this that it is doing its best to help contain the heart for whatever reason. So question about the heart. We know the heart makes him mortal again. Does it restore his humanity? Torah, he was a hero that Torog made a servant by removing his heart. He restore his heart as he return to the other side. My initial answer is no, but does it leave him on the same side and make him killable, or does it time catch up with him and he withered to dust? I think. The Laughing Hand story may be a parallel to Yasha's. And it will, I have a, a feeling now that you asked that question that they are on, they, they are on this quest to get this item, to make this thing killable. They get the item, it restores his humanity. And he wants forgiveness or to make amends or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because it that would make Oban's crew all have the same thread yeah. through all of them. They're all unwilling servants. Um, and uh, Ketagast was an angel, wasn't he? No, it's just Caleb. It's a shrunken version of Caleb Widogast. He's the real big bad. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I'd have to go back and rewatch yeah, I would have to go back lore. and rewatch it. Or... I think he was, though, but... Yeah, because I think he was one of Asmodeus's followers when Asmodeus fell. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, 
that's that would be another link for all of them. And if the Mighty Nine can find a way to pull that thread and release all these servants from their bondage and take away the, their army, they basically. Right. Uh, that would be interesting. Um, and also turns this into a get a MacGuffin for everybody. Sort of a search now. If that is the case. Um, but it's got a... <sighs> well, it wouldn't be the case for the inevitable end, though. He was never a good guy. No, but he might be in bondage to Lothal against his will. That's true. That's what I, that's what I mean. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Um, the only way the only time will tell that yeah. um, but we saw uh, in the map there was that jagged like lightning mm -hmm. bolt and Matt actually described them going through that in the first episode that they had the ball Right. So that section was definitely part of yep. the whole setup. Um, but now we have it mapped out. Is that so some good. sort of an astral rift? If they seal that, does the magic of the ball go away? Is that where the ball draws its power from? Mm. Because it's there visible where the tower is. And the tower... Yeah. Was said to be how all this works. Possibly. Um, so that's. I mean, if it's a natural rift, that would explain why it can connect to all the other areas. Yeah. Um, what if it's not an astral rift, but a temporal rift? And the happy fun time ball was broken because Halas went back in time. If Halas is the mage that went back in time and disappeared. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why time moves differently on the ball than outside. It could be. Uh, I, I got to say, I haven't put much thought on that because that just came to me, but uh, interesting. I think we'll get some more answers. Um, we also got some information about the maintenance of the ball mm -hmm. when the golem entered the garden yes. after the death of the Frankimuth. Um which was a fun encounter, I think. Yeah. Uh, do we want to... I always feel bad by mentioning anything that... mistakes that were made mechanically at the table. Um, well, in the Frog Hamath, let's talk about one thing that was brand new. Okay. Widow Gas Web of Fire. Yes. Oh, yes, I did want to talk about that. And I, let me get my, because uh, I retweeted. Yeah, uh, you retweeted, Liam. and uh, I took a picture of the spell to... description, or screenshot. So while you're looking that up, it is a fourth level spell, uh, one action, 60 foot range, vocal somatic and material, a cat's cradle of thread or string coated in phosphorus is the material component. Yep. Duration is instantaneous. It is a dex save. Striking both palms upon the ground, a web of flame crackles around the caster and five streaks of fire rapidly snake along the ground towards up to five enemies the caster can see within a range of 60 feet, leaping to their target and exploding into a column of flame 
upon reaching them. Each target must make a dex saving throw, taking 8d6 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successive one. Alternatively, all five streaks can instead converge toward a single target, dealing 12d6 fire damage on a failed, or half as much on a successful one. The fire can travel over obstacles up to five feet high and ignites flammable objects along its path that aren't worn or carried. And then, of course, at higher levels, you add a d6. Right. So it's a level higher than fireball. And essentially is giving you fireball's damage to five individual targets that you choose. Yes. In a 125 foot radi uh, diameter circle. Yes. Because there's no directionality on the 60 feet. Yeah. It's just 60 feet from the caster. Yep. Um, I think it's interesting design. Uh, my my comment on Twitter was it reminds me of the Tholian web, uh, which. If you don't know the original series, the Tholians are basically fire lizards, um, and they trap the Enterprise in a flaming yeah. web, basically. Um, so there were a lot of people. I saw some pe Matt, Matt retweeted somebody giving them shit um, about you know this is way too much damage. The damage curve, fireball exceeds the damage curve because of legacy reasons and all this other stuff. And like my specific problem with this is the fact that it is such a huge area. I think I would have liked to see it a sixty foot cone. Okay. Five targets within that cone. Um just because, for me, it strains credulity that you're going to be able to light on fire 120 feet around you. Anything. Because it says it ignites on the yeah. way to the target. So, uh, I don't know. That's, that's my only problem with it. Um, I like the fact that you can do that damage to a bunch of different people or concentrate and do a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, because there aren't that many single target spells at fourth level yeah. that do damage. Uh, most wizard spells are designed for crowd control. That's the role yeah. they play. Um, and this is still very crowd controlling. Yeah. But it has the option of being single target. I'm going to burn you. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And it is wizard only. Yes. Um, and my comments also included, you know, I understand why Caleb would want to design a fire spell like this, that he can choose his targets and not just blast indiscriminately. Um, and it's also harking back to his evocation wizard days. Right. Um, and part of me thinks that maybe this is in that book that he carries. That maybe that book is his old evocation spell book. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think we will see more of it. Um, yeah, I don't... I didn't have, a, yeah, and the other comment I made, which is immaterial really, to the debate, was, well, except to say that all the people giving him shit should lay off, yeah. is that having a spell like this n takes away from the evocation wizard specialty, in the sense that you now have essentially an area of effect fire spell that you don't have to worry about hurting your friends. Yeah. And the evocation wizard, that's sort of their deal, is you can cast the fireball and protect your friends. 
Um, but Liam is not designing for the game. Liam is designing a spell for his character yeah. in their game. So it doesn't need to take into account all of those things. Yeah. Um, which is why homebrewing well, can ignore a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, that would, you would normally have to play test and play test and how is this exploitable by this? Is it, is it broken if it multi-classes into something? Uh, that kind of thing. Where uh, in a home game, you don't have to worry about that. Right. Um, the flip side of that, that's also why homebrew content has the bad reputation it does as being totally broken all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, it's... It's always a balancing act. Um, I always try to balance my created content um, and with a thought about overall balance, but yeah. Um, but back to what, what I expect in the coming episodes. Yeah. If it's not mono drones in the tower, uh, well, the arcane armory, if they go there, I think is going to be animated armor, animated swords, iron golem. Uh, we may even see an iron golem in the tower, mm -hmm. um, which would be a significant challenge for them. Yeah. Uh, because I think Iron Golems are CR-15, I think? Yeah, I think so. Um, so it's a matter of they are going to just... It will be able to take a third of their hit points in a hit. Uh, probably. Yeah. Because the Froghemoth CR-10 took a quarter of Ford's health yeah. in one hit. I love Sam's... It's safer in here. <laughs> I'll take my my four points and half of acid damage in turn. Right. Uh, oh, the mechanical mistake made in that fight, because that's what brought on the discussion of the spell. Sneak attack. Matt gave Sam his sneak attack dice. Yep. Um, and disadvantage is the way that that goes away. It doesn't matter if you have allies adjacent or whatever. If you have disadvantage in the attack, you don't get your sneak attack. Matt gave it to him. I don't have a problem with Matt giving it to him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, rules is written, yes, but... He is shooting at the thing at, in, at its insides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that warrants sneak attack no matter what. Personally, I would give it to him. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't fault in the moment that decision at all. Um, because it was, a uh, Matt talked it out, made his internal monologue external, talked it out, thought about it, and was like, there are many factors that you qualify for, plus you're inside the damn thing. Take yeah. your sneak attack. Um, and it almost got not out. Uh, but I think the balance of that is not critically glitched, or she rolled a one. Yeah. And took... A one and a two on disadvantage. Yep. Took damage from the Tinker Top Blaster. So, I mean, to me, the dice made that fight. Anything wrong that was done, the dice yeah. made up for. Um, the dice? No. Yeah. Well, in... Uh, when Laura's D20 hopped out and hit Talison's arm, and it, she's like, I don't know, do you want me? And it was like, if it was good, you'd use it, which is probably true. But she re-rolled anyway, and it was the same number. And it's like, the dice no. Yep. Uh, so yeah. Um, and I think all of the monsters that they are going to encounter in here that are guardians of a room, uh, if it's not a mob of them, uh, are going to be CR 10 plus. 
Yeah. Because it's the Archmage Bane. Yeah. So they have to be... This is going to be things out of Morning Cannons, mostly. I hadn't considered that. Although the Frankemoth is out of all those. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and the Grom. Well, it, okay, the upper end of Volos <laughs> and Morning Cannons. Because that's yeah. the, the top of Volos. Yeah, and he's used uh, Morning Cannons before. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, he had the monster before it came out. Yeah. Uh, so we're out of time for this week. We're going to go enjoy uh, Matt and Talison yep. on Talks. And uh, we will see you guys uh, next week. Yeah. See ya.